Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy Monday. Welcome to the R Studio Enterprise Community Meetup. I'm Rachel, I'm calling in from Boston today. I would love to introduce our speaker, Marav Yurav Lipker, co founder and CEO of Data Society. Marav will share with us some lessons in communicating the value of data science and bridging the gap between teams. Well, thank you so much for, for joining. Let me go ahead and actually share my screen here so you can all see what I'm seeing. Um, this is meant to be informal. As Rachel said, uh, you know, this is really, really fun for me to do these types of presentations to be able to share the best practices that we've learned and then, um, you know, hear from you and hear what else you're interested in. So don't be shy with questions. Um, that's exactly why I'm here. All right, uh, so hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, looks good. Looks good. Okay, great. So I like to call this presentation Talk Data to Me because I'm a nerd and I like puns. Um, but really the subtext here is communicating the value of data. So I'll give you a bit of a history of myself and talk um, a little bit about what I do. Before I do that, just wanted to let everyone know presentation best practices. So I like to have this at the beginning of each one, just as a gentle reminder. Um, you know, we want this group to be interactive. You're all here to get value and to learn something new. Uh, so just silence alerts from emails, cell phone slacks, text messages, and then participate in discussions. I do have some discussion questions. So I want this to be interactive. This is really your time to be able to learn what you want to learn. And I want to make sure that everybody um, can really walk away with something concrete. So uh, as Rachel said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Data Society. Just to give you an idea of who we are, I'm the company that I helped start back in 2014. I'm actually did not start in the data science field. So my background is in education. I started as a public school teacher in New York City teaching elementary special education for a number of years. And that's where my passion is. It's really in education. It's in, in empowering individuals um, and providing skills for them to really supercharge what they're able to do and maximize their impact. And that's really what we do at Data Society, where we just help professionals use data better. We deliver custom data science training programs to organizations. We also have a solution side of the house. But over eight years, we've seen a really interesting evolution of um, of what organizations and professionals are, are looking for in data. And that's some of what we'll talk about today. And as best practices go with, um, with any teaching, for those who know education, we like to start out with some objectives. What are you going to walk away with today? Um, so an understanding of some challenges that data professionals still face today, that you might all face today, data trends, how they've shifted since 2018, 2017. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then also some concrete steps that you can take to better communicate the value of data, incorporate data-driven practices into your organization. And if there's something here that's on this list that you're not seeing that you wanna walk away with, um, let me know in the chat, or you can also put that in Slido. I wanna leave plenty of time for questions and discussions at the end to make sure that Again, we're answering the questions that you have. All right. Uh, and with that, there is a survey link here. Um, actually, let me see if I can uh, post that in the chat. This is the survey. This is what I like to call the frustrated data scientist survey. If you are a data professional, um, you might face some frustration and we wanna learn more about that. Um, because that's some of what I'll be talking about today. So if you have a few minutes, um, this is the only time I'll say, yeah, feel free to open another window. If you wanna fill out the survey, you're more than welcome to. We'll learn a little bit more about that. All right, okay, let's turn back time. 2018, folks, what was happening in 2018? Uh, well, those who don't remember, Black Panther came out. That was a pretty big hit. Um, People were eating Tide Pods. Does anybody else remember that in the US? This was this might have been only an American thing, really, um, where there was something called the Tide Pod Challenge and um, it didn't end very well, but uh, that's just, 
what it was. Um, Beyonce made history in Coachella. This is also when Time's Up movement started. K-pop started to gain popularity kind of all over the globe. Harry married Meghan. They were also still royals. Like there was a lot of stuff happening in 2018 and it might feel away now given where we were at the moment. But that was the, the culture back then. And specific to data science, when we think about what did the field look like back then, there were a few things that were happening at the time. So the first one is that there was more of a focus on some data pipelines starting to shift. You know, APIs were becoming very popular because people just heard that they were being used a lot. There were some advances in NLP as well as deep learning. I believe the BERT model paper came out during that time. And there's also an increased demand on model interpretation. So as data was growing, what I would say is more people were realizing, oh, we don't really understand this. And just to give you an idea, when we started, um, when we started in 2014, we would go to meetings with potential clients and partners. And we would say, you know, we teach like our programming, for example. And we got the question, no kidding, we got the question, oh, why is it called R? Why didn't you call it S? Like, why didn't you call it something else? Like we say Python programming, like, oh, why is it called Python, right? So really, if we remember all the way back in 2014, like open source languages were not really well known outside of the data community, statistician community. Fast forward to 2018, it became a lot more popular. But what we found is that a lot of, um, data professionals who we worked with felt just really frustrated and stuck. Typically, they were maybe the only person in the organization that knew how to use one of these tools. Um, they got a lot of nonsensical requests. They spent most of their time explaining data, digging around in data, using Excel. Um, you know, so there's there was a lot of that happening. And one of the things that we wanted to find out is, okay, um, well, how can we better help people? So back in 2018, uh, we were a pretty small company, pretty small community. So I just posted something on Medium, said why we're giving away data science training materials for free, um, because I built a survey that, based, that kind of asked some of these questions to understand what the pain points were. And at the end of the survey, um, I'd be able to compile the results, take some of those trends, and then be able to um, actually build a toolkit that could address some of these pain points. So this is what the survey looked like. This is back in our old branding. Um, I left that survey up for hmm, a month-ish. Um, we ended up getting almost 200 responses, which for us was great at the time. Like I said, we were a small company. Um, you know, we're we're bootstrapped, so we didn't have a VC or anything like that. And then I took that, we um, then posted the results on Medium again, and then we were able to um, send out a toolkit that was really focused for data professionals who felt frustrated, felt as though they were stuck, felt as though they couldn't communicate insights correctly. And I have a really terrible joke. Um, that I'll tell you now, which is, you know, if um, a data scientist finds a new insight, but nobody around her understands it, does it matter, right? And like, sadly, the answer is no, it's kind of a sad joke, but uh, I appreciate it for anybody who gave me the pity laugh um, while you were on mute, so thank you. Um, and we, we know the value of, we, everybody I think on this call understands the value of data. And so for us, we felt like it was such a missed opportunity and a lot of lost resources to have such talented people working on insights that at the end of the day would never be implemented, right? And so the results that we found <clears throat> at the time, this was again, this was 2018, leadership, non-data colleagues, they didn't really understand what data could do. Um, about 30% of data professionals time was spent explaining results. So imagine in 40 hours, in a 40 hour week, you're spending 10 to 15 hours of that, literally just telling other people about the work that you're doing. And we got a lot of um, magic uh, comments in our open-ended section where a lot of people said, yeah, like my boss feels like what I do is magic. Like I just click a button, 
magic happens, right? Um, and so those were the types of trends that we were seeing. So based on that, um, we developed a toolkit. And what does toolkit include? So there are kind of three components to it. Um, the toolkit, we call it the data science communicator toolkit. And what it's meant to do is to help facilitate a conversation between you, the data professional, and people around you who might not understand data. So the first thing is marketing, right? Um, so the toolkit comes with a presentation, it comes with a script, and it also comes with sample email templates that can that you can really just copy and paste and send out, you know, putting in what whatever you want. Um, so the email template you saw first, this is an example of the script. Um, and then we have a slide deck as well that's based off of the topics that we saw created the most frustration. So when we're thinking about what did that presentation actually include, it was a lot of what data science can do and can't do, um, talking about some ethics behind data science, focusing specifically on how difficult it is to collect data, um, right? It's not all of a push of the button to start facilitating the communication and actually kind of building a common vocabulary, right? Um, and that was the purpose behind it. So we sent the toolkit out, got some great responses back. It still exists, um, it's still around and you can absolutely access it. And I think Rachel, I think it's still on the, the champion page if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is. I will share that in the chat too. I'll put in a plug for that if you just wanna take a look at what it was. Um, <laughs> and you know, come 2022 and things are a little bit different. Right. Uh, so first of all, COVID happened. That was obviously a, a huge, huge shift. Um, people are working more remotely. There's a ton more data that exists, even from 2018 to today. Alongside, there's really been, yeah, an increased focus of data everywhere, right? So if you have a Fitbit, which I have um, as well, if you have an Apple Watch, if you take bikes in the city or any type of um, individual transportation like the scooters, people can track movements within a city. Um, so you're all of a sudden seeing again, such an influx of individual information on top of the fact that especially with the COVID pandemic, hey, data actually became, I mean, it was always, there were some cases where it was life or death, but now there were a lot of cases where that's true, right? If people, if health um, agencies weren't sharing information with each other, we're really talking about lives that were at stake. So COVID plus increase of data, everywhere. And then in the past few years, one of the shifts that we've seen is a focus for more companies and more organizations to become data driven. So what, what I would say is in our earlier years, um, even through 2018 and 2019, training programs were focused on specific technical skills, right? So just intro programming, machine learning techniques, neural networks, text mining, um, but these were folks that already had essentially a background in data. There was some Excel training, Power BI Tableau as well, but it wasn't as prominent. In the past few years, we've seen a lot more of a demand for almost like a holistic data academy continuous learning, where now there's a mandate coming from, from senior leadership, and I don't know if you've seen this where you are, where um, they're determined to become a data literate organization. So now it's not just the data scientists, but it's literally everybody within the organization needs to have at least a basic understanding of what data does, how to use it, um, how to manage it, right? We're seeing an increase in data governance. So if you work, if you work in any type of a healthcare company or finance, you probably have already had a lot of these regulations in place. If you don't, you're probably gonna see a lot more of that. So obviously you're up past GDPR, and that was a really, really big shift in terms of how we think about data. I know California also passed, I believe it's called the CPAA, uh, similar to the GDPR about giving ownership back to individuals. So ownership of data back to individuals. So in addition to these trends, another trend that we're seeing is, okay, well now everybody needs to understand data compliance, data ethics. Um, you need to understand data governance, how to manage that appropriately. And that requires a level of knowledge that some people don't have. So um, on the back of all of these trends, we thought, okay, well, it's been about four years. Um, let's check in with the people <laughs> that we, 
you know, that we saw a little while ago, right? Like what's happening now? What are they seeing in space? So I'm going to caveat this with, um, we released the updated survey a few weeks ago. Um, and we have about 40 responses at my last check. So the, the number of responses is a little bit lower, which is why I encourage everybody, if you have an opportunity to take it, please do. Um, that'll just help us better understand where we are today. But even so, we're finding some insights and some shifts that I wanted to share with you. So these are the never before seen released results um, of the updated survey. And in addition to that, um, we're going to be updating the toolkit accordingly to, again, really just help people communicate better with the organization. So one of the biggest shifts that we saw from, from 2018 to today, and we, by the way, over time, we've collected almost 400 responses. So now we have sample size of 400 versus about 40. So just wanted to put that disclaimer out there. We're all numbers people. But there was a shift in terms of what data professionals wish that their management and leadership knew, which is it went from top issue was what data science can and cannot do, was that was what was identified in 2018. In 2020, it's actually flipped with the second place one, which is how data science can actually impact the company. And everything else actually looks to be about the same. Um, people are still feeling like nobody understands how much time it takes, what different data science methods do, what different tools do. And to me, what this says is, okay, since 2018, more people understand what data science is almost as a concept, if that makes sense. But um, people still don't really understand the applications behind it and how it can be used. So I thought that was a pretty interesting shift. Um, you know, beyond that, do you think your organization is using data effectively? Same proportion of people said yes versus no. I was hoping that the proportion would be a little bit more even, but we're looking at about 35% to 65% who said no. So it's clear that at least in terms of the data professional world, there's a lot of work left to be done. Um, people understand that data is important, but maybe they're still not leveraging it effectively. Um, some, other, some other trends here, you know, so some of the questions that we asked, what are some of the biggest changes that other people have seen? An increased demand for data related roles. So we all know hiring has had some ups and downs, especially this year, but in general, data roles still remain pretty high in demand. Um, and now there's less of a lone data scientist um, like in existence. Now what we're seeing is that there's more people that are joining teams of data professionals. So that's also a shift that we're seeing. Um, increased amounts of training, more investment in data tools um, were the top three there. And then some of the biggest challenges, and this is actually mirrors very much what we see as well putting work into scalable production, again, building those pipelines. So I know that MLOps has become a really popular topic. We actually developed our own program for it last year because we saw the demand for it. People can build algorithms, but now it's a question of how do you operationalize it? How do you scale it? Um, getting access to the data that you need, again, that's a pretty tough challenge for people. Still see that and communicating data effectively with my colleagues. So those were the top three challenges that people are still seeing. You know, what I would say is putting work into scalable production is less of something that we saw in 2018. It's definitely something we're seeing a lot more today. And so I'm curious to hear um, about your feedback. I see um, Lisa said she feels like, yes, this very much reflects what she knows. And uh, Jeff is feeling a little bit of that pain of the amount of time that it takes for data. Um, so hopefully these, some of these pain points and maybe some of these improvements are, are speaking to you. So <clears throat> some other trends that we're seeing, and I pull these quotes directly um, from our survey, we do have some open-ended opportunities. Most people still think it's really easy to gather data. 
I don't know why this is something we try to focus on with a lot of the programs that we run, which is it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. Um, magic still appears even in 2022. So did, machine learning can't do magic, right? Again, we had a lot of responses saying um, there were misperceptions, misconceptions about how data analytics can be performed. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a situation where people have enough knowledge to know that it can do stuff, but don't understand the limitations, right? So data science means anything is possible because look at Google. Yes, if we were to look at Google, right? If we were to look at those really high tech organizations, it seems like they can do anything and everything with data analytics and machine learning. But, you know, it's easy to look at them and say they can do all of this, we can too. Um, and it's another thing to actually take a look and evaluate the infrastructure that you have in place with an organization, right? Um, how is your data stored? How is it being collected? Who knows how to use it, right? So there's a lot of people that said, my manager thinks I can do anything with machine learning. And in theory, that's kind of true, but it's also not if they don't have the relevant support behind them. Interestingly enough, 30% of time on average is still spent explaining results. I would have hoped, you know, that would be a little bit less. Um, but, you know, overall what we're seeing, in, at least in the responses so far, and we're hoping to collect some more, is that people have a better idea of data, but they don't really understand the nuances behind what's possible and what's not. They're having difficulty understanding the applications. And um, that still seems to be like a big challenge for most people. With that, I have a discussion question for you and I'm seeing some people are already um, chiming in. So I'll give folks a few minutes in the chat. How is this similar to what you're seeing? Um, alternatively, are there different pieces that I'm missing here? Are there other pain points that you're seeing in your organization um, that uh, you know, I haven't addressed? And feel free, you can put it in the chat if you're feeling brave. Um, you can always unmute yourself and provide a, a verbal comment. So um, I'll give folks a few minutes to just type in and tell us like, what else are you seeing? Is this accurate for you? Hi. Like, oh, there it goes. I was afraid I didn't let people uh, <laughs> unmute there. There we go. <laughs> Figured I'd say it rather than type because I type so much during the day. But yeah, very much uh, feeling that. And um, I started my analytics career like 20 years ago and then worked in academia for a while and I'm back in industry. And it just like sort of is shocking, like how like little progress has been made or like maybe being in a different industry, how it's like things are still so messy and it's just kind of shocking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the comment. And you, you have a really interesting experience going from industry to academia and then back to, to industry. And so um, there's so much, so much advancement in the actual field of data, right? But then industry, it feels as though takes a longer time to catch up as well. Um, so I appreciate that perspective. Thanks, Lisa. I see Laura, you have your hand raised too. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I just wanted to expand. It seems a couple of us have a similar issue is that um, our data team, um, we can provide places to start inputting data from our fields. Um, I work in a fundraising capacity. Um, so we can give um, pipelines for people to start recording various activities that they they uh, perform to see what leads to say a donation. Um, but so our leadership is saying, well, we've given you ways to measure those. Now, why aren't you giving me the answer? Um, when maybe our field doesn't understand that they need to enter the data or they have their own shadow Excel system um, and they aren't recording into our pipeline. So our pipeline doesn't necessarily look correct. Um, and so, you know, the data team were like, we don't wanna give you this answer that you've asked for because we don't trust this data at all but they said well give me the answer and we'll worry about it later so it's kind of the partnership of we have to give the data back to our field members 
in some sort of analytic way um, so that they can see the value of the data. But when the starting point is so poor, um, we don't want to give them wrong information. So getting the non-data people in on the value of data world when you're starting from maybe a less data mature situation um, has been one of our biggest challenges in, in various places. Yeah, and and Laura, I, I I hear you 100%. We see a lot of that, and I see that trend continuing for the foreseeable future because it takes a while for people to kind of figure out to know what they don't know and then actually be willing to learn it and then apply it in that situation. So it's it's hard when you're starting from a point where people might not really understand what you're saying, but you have to be able to communicate results in some form, right? Um, so we've seen we've seen that across a lot and and that's a great point um as well so thank you for that and i'm seeing a lot of people being active in the chat which is great um a couple of other points to make you know i think john made a good point where um explaining data is not always lost time especially if you're doing it for clients absolutely agree um and maybe i need to reframe my question a little bit because I had in my mind, you know, explaining the work that you're doing to other colleagues, which again, is not necessarily time lost. Um, but if there are ways to streamline that to make it easier. Uh, but I completely hear what you're saying. And, and I do think that, that makes sense. I'm also seeing a couple of folks saying, yeah, people want to hire more data scientists. But what they really need is a data engineer, for example. And there are, there's definitely a lot of job postings that I've seen out there. I'm sure you have too, where somebody wants to hire a data scientist um, that has experience with every tool under the sun, plus like a decade of experience in analysis. And you can tell that they're not really sure what they're looking for. So I think that's a really interesting point as well. Like people know that they need these folks, but don't really know how to describe the responsibilities. Uh, so I'm loving the chat that's happening. Please keep it coming. And it's kind of nice to know that on some level, we're all going through the same thing. <laughs> like nobody here is alone. Um, so there's a lot of that as well. Yeah, bring, making the case for cultural change, completely agree. Um, that's a really, really important one. Learning how to communicate with leaders and having leaders actually take the responsibility of learning themselves about data. That's something that we found to be really helpful. You know, we have a, an executive level workshop that we deliver that when, um, when executives take it, they do feel more confident, right? So just being more confident about data and understanding the strategy can help them be more open. So definitely if you don't have a program like that, um, or if you think that your leaders are open to it, even doing something like a lunch and learn for them, can be really helpful. So speaking of helpful, um, <laughs> don't worry, Libby, bring out all the feels. Please feel free. This is a safe space for everyone. Um, so feelings galore, I encourage everybody um, to feel their feelings all the time. Yes, and one other thing Laura just added in there, um, making a dashboard. And I saw this in some of the responses as well, that making a dashboard was the same as um, doing data science. Dashboards are easy for people to understand. So that's the first line of defense um, for people who want to quote unquote do data. And if you're trying to get your organization into a more data-driven mindset, that's a really useful tool, but it's also important for them to understand the difference between having a dashboard, which can be descriptive versus something more predictive, for example. So let's talk about what we can do about this. Um, I'm seeing in the chat, I'm hearing from you, the pain points still exist, right? Um, and so what can we do to start to shift that? And in fact, um, excuse me, I just saw Lisa saying that she's nerd lunch, um, hoping that it's a casual way to introduce data literacy concepts. I love that. I think having these types of programs internally really speed up the um, adoption of data and the understanding of data. And in fact, um, that's one of my, my pieces here, right? So when we're talking about everybody on this call, you have pain points, and I recognize um, that you're all working really hard. 
So this is not meant to be an added burden, but rather an opportunity to think through what options could work best for you, given where you are and given where your organization is. First thing is to find a champion or be a champion, right? Um, what we found to be most effective is finding somebody in leadership. If you have a CTO, CIO, CDO, or anybody at the C-level who's passionate about data, who has access to budget, who has a say, having somebody from leadership saying, hey, this is the direction we need to go in, here are resources for you, is incredibly powerful, especially with people who might be a little bit more resistant to learning about data. Knowing that their leadership is expecting it um, can really help speed that process up. Along those lines, if you're feeling up to it, offering some types of data trainings to develop a common data vocabulary, empower staff. Again, the updated toolkit that we'll be releasing um, probably within the next couple of weeks can be a great starting point for just a lunch and learn. Help people around you understand what data can and cannot do, help them understand you know, how they can contribute um, and make your life easier, right? Because I think most people in general don't, you know, they wanna be able to do this on their own, they just don't know how. Um, giving people time and space to be innovative. So asking others, maybe other data professionals around you, hey, how are you using data? Um, I think one of the most important things, this is why I love, um, you know, kind of the RStudio community is um, sharing best practices, especially internal to an organization is such a powerful resource that generally isn't leveraged to the fullest. So finding other people in your organization who, who can do that and starting to share, you're gonna really find um, a strong group of folks that will encourage data adoption um, and will also potentially help you solve some challenges that you're seeing in the space because they're familiar with the architecture, with the tools within an organization. Um, so then, and that's the last one, right? Providing space and technology for people to innovate or bringing in outside resources to do the same. Um, and I'll just put in a plug. One of the things that I do, honestly, this is just something that I do for free, is I do have a um, presentation that talks about what data science can and cannot do. And the whole purpose of it is to facilitate this type of conversation. Happy to chat with you if you think that's helpful for your organization. Easy for us to set up um, a lunch and learn where I can just come in and do that and hopefully start to, to support your efforts and facilitate that communication. Being a role model, I'm sure most of you are already doing this. Um, but if you're not, or if you think there are ways to improve, here are some, some suggestions as well. <clears throat> so um, asking for metrics or analysis behind conclusions and reports or providing them and showing that this is what the standard needs to look like. Making sure that you're asking and addressing powerful questions. So um, talking about what the implications are behind the insights. Um, using tools and exercises to get people out of the box, you know, finding ways to connect with them that, you know, will help them better understand what you're doing. Talk about what it means to make a decision based on data. I saw somebody earlier said, you know, we're still at a level where we're all trusting our gut. I saw several of those comments also in even the updated survey responses. So it's still happening. You can trust your gut and then see if the data verifies it. You know, I would say it's not always either or um, because we don't want to discount, you know, levels of experience, but I think we're at a point where those levels of experience need to be supplemented um, by data. And then again, engaging creative thinking to drive innovation, <clears throat> providing a safe space. So a safe space like this one, a safe space like nerd lunch, um, any type of lunch and learn that you have, uh, even with other data professionals, just what types of crazy ideas do you have? Like what would be interesting to explore, right? Um, talk about what's possible. And one of the things that um, I always encourage any data professional to do is find successful examples of data projects within your organization. 
So whether it's one that you did, one that your colleague did, leadership understands projects that are done internally. So if you can show results, they will have much more understanding of what's possible and they're much more likely to support your efforts. So make sure to communicate um, with those successes. And again, build that community of practice. It can start from this community. It can start from any other internal community that you have. So that's also been a really key um, piece of success. Oh, I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, <laughs> giving recognition. Again, if there's a successful project, like shout to the rooftops about it, have a lunch to learn about it. Is there a newsletter? Maybe write a blurb about it, right? Um, if you have a hackathon, um, demonstrate, you know, what were the three, the top three most successful outcomes from a hackathon. Shedding light on that not only um, encourages leadership to look more into data, but it also encourages them to keep doing a good job. You know, people like to be recognized for the work that they're doing. And so being able to recognize that is incredibly important. And then don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, you know, one of the things that we do internally is if there's ever something that goes a little bit differently than what we expected, whether it's on the solutions or the training side, we do debrief and just say, okay, why did this happen? How do we prevent it moving forward, right? There's no blame. Um, and that helps people feel comfortable innovating. It also helps people feel more comfortable asking for help when they need it. All right, last discussion question, and then I will open it up to any type of questions that you have. Um, but you know, my question to you is, we, we talked about some concrete things that you yourself can do. Um, you know, what else have you seen be effective um, to build a data-driven environment or to help other people understand what you're doing in a way that's supportive to you. Awesome, so Lisa's saying, having upper management who support the effort. Oh, Eugene, that's a really interesting point. Stop using the word data, get specific. I like that, like, what metrics are you looking at? What type of data, right? And I see Leanne has her hand raised. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to share something that an uh, initiative that we've been doing at the Financial Times where I work and um, we as a wider data science of which I run is a part of the wider analytics organization and we've had a big data democratization program which is all around kind of putting data in the hands of people and as part of that we really invested in our um, hiring in a learning and development individual who's specialist uh, in data so she comes from a data analytics background but her education is in learning and development and it's quite a unique niche role quite hard to source these types of people but that's been fantastic because part of her role is both in educating a lot of what we've been talking about is that whole education of the wider uh, business community but um, it's both a push and a pull in the sense of that she will both uh, educate kind of the wider business about the different types of analyses, descriptive, prescriptive, predictive, and help them to learn to interrogate their own questioning about what mm. they're trying to find out from data so that they have already kind of understand why they're asking those questions and what's actually relevant right through to then actually helping us become better data practitioners I guess as well as part of her responsibility and it's a very like interesting dynamic and really intrigued as to how that will work but it's been a really lovely part of our kind of data democratization rollout is, is having that individual so definitely a, a champion for that. That's that's awesome and can I ask Leanne how often does that individual come to work with you what's the cadence there? So it's kind of, so they're 100% dedicated to analytics. Unfortunately, this is where it gets into difficulty that the business doesn't quite still understand like they're like a la less priority than like other roles in our organizations. So like, for example, they're still a contractor. Um, at the moment, the way that it works is that whenever I got, so for example, my two lead data scientists need a career plan putting together um, for them and their teams. And so I've gone to her from like some career coaching consultancy for, for them. So it's kind of in that scenario, it's very ad hoc. 
And then um, in the kind of business faking scenario, it's very um, like strategic and very organized. So she's working with various bits of the business, whether that be B2C, B2B, et cetera, to educate them around those concepts. Um, so in terms of our needs, it's ad hoc, but she recognizes that that's like 50% of her role. So it's dependent on where kind of the demand is. That, that's great. And that's really helpful. And, and I agree, like what I've seen and, and what I've had some requests to do is just be an outside voice that comes in, somebody who's not prone to um, any, any internal um, kind of organizational behaviors, just to speak and bring in my perspective to help support data professionals internally. Um, and sometimes you just need an external voice to come in and facilitate that conversation. So um, I, I really appreciate that. And I, I think that's a really interesting way to do it as well. Um, so thank you for that. I'm seeing some other comments. So I'm just gonna um, go in here, you know, definitely using words that people can connect with, like changing analytics to informatics. Um, Laura, the confusion of data requests and report analysis requests. Data is not the same thing as analysis. Yep, I hear you. Um, and then talking, um, Libby mentioned, you know, having a manager director who's willing to say no to things that don't make sense for the team to work on who protects their time. I agree, if you have a manager who's supportive, even if they're not necessarily technical, but they understand what you're doing, that does make a huge difference as well, because then you have an advocate in your corner that can also um, bring the work that you're doing to the forefront. So I love all of these chats. With that, that's the end of my formal presentation. I'll just leave this here. This is my email. It's just marav at datasociety.com. Um, I'm not burdening people with having to spell my last name, but if you wanna chat, if anything that I said resonated with you, or if you're interested in doing a lunch and learn for your own organization, just let me know. And this is what I love doing. Like I said, my background's in education, so I enjoy sharing best practices, sharing the knowledge that we've acquired over the past eight years as we've been working on this. And really my main goal is to just um, support you in the work that you're doing, right? And make sure that you have an environment around you that understands the value of what you bring to the table. And um, let's do questions. Let's do any and all questions. So. Perfect. Thank it. you. There actually aren't that many questions on Slido because I see that a lot of people are putting comments into the chat too, which I absolutely love. But one of the questions that was on Slido was, how did you make the transition from special education teacher into data? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I'll tell you that it was a lot of serendipity. Um, I was in the classroom for a number of years and then I decided that I wanted to be able to have an impact on a larger scale. So I then spent the next um, several years working at different educational institutions like Kaplan, um, like the International Baccalaureate Organization, just really learning everything there is to know about education, training and assessments. And honestly, I had a, a mutual friend who, um, was having trouble finding out how to learn about data and how to learn specifically actually was our programming. Um, he was an analyst on Wall Street. He spent most of his time in Excel and a friend of his showed him how he could automate literally three weeks of work into an afternoon. So, you know, he saw the value of that. And then when I was in my career, I also was using some data-driven methods, but I, couldn't find any resources that were specific to me as a professional where I could just pick it up quickly. Um, so we had a conversation and thought, well, if we can't find what we need, let's build it. Um, you know, so it was uh, myself and then two other co-founders. And, um, and, you know, I said that the best thing that happens is that we still have a company and we build something cool. And the worst thing that happens is that I learn a lot and you know, I did quit my job nine months into it. And I said, well, I can always go find another job. Um, and so along the way, I learned data science and I found it to be um, to really empowering. I've never programmed before and to understand how it works, 
to understand um, how it can be impactful for folks. Um, and then building something was really fun for me. So I just love solving challenges. And this was definitely a lot of challenges to solve. That's great. I, I don't think I see other Slido questions. So I do want to open it up to broader discussion and I can stop the recording, but I had one question too. Um, I was curious, have you ever been in a position where you're not able to make the case to leadership or they're like pushing back on you and, and what do you do in that situation? We do get a lot of pushback. Um, interestingly enough, what I would say is it's not always top tier leadership. Um, a lot of times it's kind of management folks that have been doing this for a while don't really see a need to change. You know, there are a few points that I bring up that I think are particularly effective. The first one is it's not something, let's say, that we're forcing you to do tomorrow, right? We're not going to shift everything that you're doing. We're not saying that what you're doing is wrong. What we're doing is showing you a different set of tools and a different set of skills that might make your life easier. So by alleviating the type of pressure of being forced to implement this, you're giving people room to explore and understand for themselves why it's important. And sometimes, you know, it might not be. If there's a system that works well within an organization, you don't need more out of it, it's fine. I'm not going to force somebody to, you know, implement something in R if it's working just fine in Excel, right? So it's important to kind of have that mindset. I think um, the second point is, and to, again, depends on the level that you're speaking to. It will be really, really hard to stay competitive without these skills, just period, right? There are organizations that are becoming really data-driven. There are organizations that are leveraging their data very, very effectively. And that translates to increased profits, increased revenue, um, increased efficiency, more satisfaction, increased retention of employees. And guess what? If you're competing against that organization in five years and you don't have that same level of skills, you're going to be feeling it, you know? And so bringing in an element of, hey, here are what the best practitioners are doing in your industry. Um, and so if you're not driving towards that, just be aware it's going to be harder to stay competitive. You know, it's, it really is a business necessity. Um, and then the third one is, you know, bringing, finding any type of successful project or any type of um, use case that will speak to that audience, right? So whenever I give my presentations, I like to pull from different use cases um, in an industry where people can, can relate to. Um, and I find that that really helps with the light bulb moment because they start to understand how they could be doing something similar. So those are three points that I would recommend. Doesn't always work. It really does depend, um, you know, where the organization is, their budget. Um, you know, if somebody's invested like $10 million in a tool, um, you know, they're going to want to use that tool, whether it's helpful or not, right? So there are some things that are, that are harder to get around. Um, Definitely. Thank you. And um, I want to stay true to what I said, where I'll, I'll stop the recording so we all can jump in the conversation too. But on that, that point of finding different industry examples, I wanted to say this in the recording. Um, I did share the champion site, rstudio.com slash champion, which has a ton of different industry examples uh, grouped together. So it pulls together like webinars and meetups and blog posts and just lots of people talking about the ways they're using data science. Um, so that I share that in the chat too. But I will stop the recording here so we can all can just like jump in and, and chat with each other. But to anybody watching the recording, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rob.